to this webinar, uh, Building JavaScript Applications on the Salesforce One Platform. My name is Christoph Conrads. I'm a developer evangelist with uh, Salesforce. Um, I try to blog uh, quite a bit about the topic that we're going to cover today. So here is my uh, blog uh, URL. Uh, I tweet a little bit about that as well. So you're welcome to follow me on Twitter. And uh, today I'll show you a number of examples. And I try to always share these examples on GitHub. So if you're interested in uh, looking at the code for the examples that we're going to cover today, uh, feel free to visit my uh, GitHub repository. Uh, because this is a Salesforce presentation, I need to remind you to make your uh, buying decision based on currently available features and uh, not on forward-looking statements that I may make uh, during this presentation. If you are interested in this topic uh, and other topics uh, related to Salesforce, uh, these are some great ways to connect with the community uh, on Twitter, on Facebook, on LinkedIn, YouTube, uh, and Google+. And also, I need to uh, tell you that this webinar is being recorded. And uh, it's going to take about a week for the recording to be posted on the webinar homepage, the same page you use to uh, register uh, for this webinar. And finally, um, before we start, um, if you have questions during the, the webinar, uh, don't wait till the end. You can use the questions window. Uh, to post your questions, and I have people with me who will be happy to uh, answer the questions as we go uh, throughout the seminar. And finally, uh, at the end of the presentation, if we have time, I will take some of these questions live. Uh, if there are questions that uh, I didn't have time to answer, feel free to uh, tweet uh, to me directly, and also you can visit the developer forums. All right, so let's get started with the content of this webinar. So what are we going to talk about? Um, if you attend this uh, webinar because you are an existing JavaScript developer and you are kind of new to the Salesforce platform, I will take just a minute to try to uh, answer the question, why should you consider uh, building your next uh, JavaScript application on top of the Salesforce platform? If you are an existing Salesforce developer and you are somewhat new to JavaScript, uh, I'll try to quickly answer the question, you know, what can JavaScript uh, do for you and how should you consider uh, using it uh, in your existing Salesforce applications. But the meat of the presentation is really uh, going to be about five ways uh, you can use JavaScript uh, with the Salesforce platform. And I have identified five reference architectures that I'd like to present uh, to you today. And it's going to go from very simple to more complex. And along the way, we're going to discuss some interesting architectures, including the single page uh, architecture. And we'll discuss that in the context of uh, some existing JavaScript frameworks like uh, AngularJS and Ionic. All right, so let's get started. So um, if you are a JavaScript developer uh, and you have built applications before on traditional platforms, you have probably spent some time, uh, as you see on the picture at the top there, uh, setting up um, hardware, setting up software, but also implementing services that sometimes we take for granted initially, but that are extremely important to, to get right, uh, things like security, uh, scaling, and then after that, reporting, analytics, uh, and things like that. And that certainly takes time, and some of these services are really critical. Uh, certainly these days, you can't take uh, things like security uh, lightly. Um, so if you build on the Salesforce platform, the great thing is that all these services are available out of the box. Uh, you get immediately, instantly, like state-of-the-art security at the object at the field level, um, you know, the trust uh, and the reputation um, that the Salesforce platform has in terms uh, of these services. And so, as you see at the bottom there, uh, you can focus um, on building your application uh, right away. A lot of these features um, are available declaratively. By that, I mean that you can configure them with, you know, point and click uh, and in the interface, in the Salesforce interface. My background is certainly uh, in development. I have to tell you, you know, in my career, I probably built, you know, hundreds of customer objects in different languages 
and using different uh, UI front end. And I don't think that that's using my real skills as a developer to build yet another uh, customer object or yet another default uh, customer interface. So all these things can uh, be done declaratively uh, using the Salesforce platform so that you can focus and you can apply your developer skills where you can really make a difference and where they can really uh, matter. So with the Salesforce platform you have that combination of declarative and uh, programmatic uh, development. So moving on to the other side of uh, the spectrum that we're going to discuss today, why JavaScript? So if you're a Salesforce developer, uh, why would you use JavaScript in your existing application? So I'll identify quickly three points here, but I'll try to illustrate these points during the presentation by showing you a lot of examples. But at a very high level, you may consider JavaScript to build more engaging user experiences where, when you need them. Uh, we'll see uh, a, a, a lot of ways you can do that. You can also use JavaScript because there are a lot of cool things that exist already in JavaScript. A lot of existing JavaScript libraries, like for instance Google Map, Google Map or the D3 uh, charts, and uh, they come with a lot of features that you can leverage right away inside uh, your applications. And the final, you know, reason is when you may have to build completely custom applications. So by that I mean applications that live outside your uh, Salesforce instance, it's completely custom build, and JavaScript may be a great way uh, to do that. So we'll, um, we'll talk about these points um, during this presentation. But now let's get started really with the, these five ways that I talked about before. Uh, these five ways you can use JavaScript in Salesforce application. And as I, as I mentioned before, uh, it's going to go from simple, like, you know, adding some JavaScript in a Visual Force page, all the way to pretty complex architectures, uh, building consumer apps, and that will involve uh, Heroku, Heroku Connect, and we'll speak about that. That's going to be the last uh, um, architecture. In between, we will see how to build uh, JavaScript apps hosted externally, Canvas applications, and mobile, application, uh, mobile applications built as uh, hybrid apps. So let's get started with the first one. As I mentioned before, this one is really easy, uh, but you can make a, a quick difference by um, adding JavaScript in existing Visual Force pages. So let's take an example of that. So on the left, you have your client. On the right, you have the Salesforce cloud. Um, your client is going to requ request a Visual Force page that's going to be loaded uh, on the client. That Visual Force page can um, instantiate or can start a JavaScript library that can be, uh, for instance, Google Maps, uh, as you can see there. And that's all you know, business as usual because at the end of the day, a Visual Force page is just an HTML page. So just starting that library is, is very you know, business as usual, but at some point, uh, in the context of that application, you may want to access Salesforce data, you know, in the context of that page without, you know, refreshing the page or without going to another page. So how do you do that? How do you, in JavaScript, uh, get Salesforce data that, that you can use in that existing page uh, without changing it? So typically, uh, the way you do that is by going back uh, to Salesforce using one of these uh, three approaches. The first one is using the REST APIs or the JavaScript, or JavaScript remoting or remote objects. So the REST API in this space, because if you do that, you can certainly do it, but that's going to come towards your API limits. So uh, probably better ways uh, of doing it today is using JavaScript remoting and very soon uh, using a remote objects. So, um, I want to, to show you some quick examples of doing that, and then, and then we will look at uh, some code. So I'm going to switch here uh, to my browser. And the first example that I will show you, and I'm sure you have seen um, tons of examples uh, built this way. So essentially, you use a Google Maps, um, the JavaScript library, inside uh, your Visual Force pages. You can zoom in, zoom out. And then these markers, we are here in San Francisco today, these are hotels, um, you know, around uh, where we are. So, for instance, if I click one of these markers, uh, it's going to give me, you know, information about that uh, specific uh, specific hotel. So that's a very very simple 
a way to add some you know value to your page and some uh, helpful kind of visual uh, information I wanted to quickly show you another example that may be a little more sophisticated and this one is related to uh, charts so this is a kind of an executive dashboard as you can see I have my deals by month this is coming uh, mostly from the opportunities uh, object um, and it looks like a regular dashboard but it's actually a lot more interactive than, than your usual dashboard. Like for instance, if I see a spike here in April and I'm wondering what happened in April, I can simply click um, you know, that column and automatically I basically drill down into the information and you see that I have a, the concept of visual continuity here. I'm not switching context. I'm not going to another page. Everything is happening pretty smoothly and with animation uh, within the same page. And, you know, in this um, in this example, I have uh, you know different type of uh, different types of dashboards. This one is is pretty similar. This one is completely different. This is a bubble chart with uh, you know opportunities. And if I click one, you see that in that context, um, you know I have uh, another component, a gauge here with the probability of closing and that kind of stuff. So to build this type of interactive dashboard, obviously you need some level of coding uh, or some level of interaction. And this is actually using two things that we talked about before. It's using JavaScript to respond to these events uh, when I click uh, you know, on a, a specific chart but it's also using an existing um, JavaScript library and specifically in this case it's using the D3 um, charting uh, library. So now what I wanted to quickly cover with you is how you actually do this and specifically how you communicate back with Salesforce to uh, access your data. So we're going to go to the developer console uh, just for one second here. And so the first one that I will show you is uh, the, the, the map uh, example, example that we looked at before. So, uh, and this may, be not, this may not be new for uh, a lot of you people, but we will start with this. So this is just a regular um, you know, visual force page. As you can see, uh, I uh, load the, the JavaScript library, Google Maps in this case, using a simple script tags because that library is actually hosted on their CDN, so business as usual, this is just the way you would do it in HTML. And then from there, you can open a script tag and do some uh, JavaScript, I initialize the map, so this is all normal stuff. But at some point, you know, showing the map is great, but an empty map is not that helpful, so I need to get the data from somewhere, and I have a custom object in Salesforce, a hotel object, so I need to go get uh, you know that information from Salesforce. So in this specific case, uh, I'm using uh, JavaScript remoting, and this is the syntax that you would use here: uh, remoting manager invoke action. Uh, the important thing here is that so this is actually the name of a custom controller that you will uh, use to uh, give you the list of hotels, and you see that it has a find all method. So let's take a quick look at that hotel remoter uh, class. Uh, it's right here, and you see that it's actually super easy. It has one method that is called find all that returns a list of hotels. It's annotated as a remote action so that you can invoke it uh, using JavaScript remoting. And the way you actually provide the data is simply by running a SQL uh, statement. And from there, in your um, in your Visual Force page, you you will actually get a JSON document back. And all I'm doing here is looping through uh, that document and adding a marker for each object. And then you see that when I add a marker, uh, again, in JavaScript, I'm adding an event listener so that when um, the user clicks one of these markers, I'm actually going to the details page for that specific hotel, uh, as I showed you before. So uh, very, very simple. Let me let me quickly show you the dashboard page because it's a little different. So in this case, so this is the, this is the full uh, dashboard page. You see that it's not uh, that big. But what's really different here is the way we load the JavaScript library, or should I say here, libraries. And you see that in this case, I'm loading a ton of um, you know, JavaScript files in a production environment. You, you probably want to concatenate all these files uh, in a single one. 
But the key difference here is that uh, these files are not loaded from a, a CDN. They are actually hosted inside your Salesforce instance. And we have different ways to actually import uh, these libraries, but the key concept uh, to understand here is that to make these, file, uh, these files available, you need uh, to declare a static or to uh, define a static resource uh, in Salesforce. So let me show you how that works if you haven't done that. You see that in this case, in this org, developer org, I have a bunch of uh, static resources. So these are basically JavaScript libraries or it can be anything, assets, images, and things like that, that you load and that you, you, you make available to your uh, Visual Force pages. It, it can be very granular, like for instance I have jQuery as a static resource, but it can be also a very big, uh, you know, essentially a full-blown app, like for instance I have here a dashboard embedded, and that's a zip file that essentially includes um, all the libraries that I needed to load uh, my dashboard. So two ways to actually load JavaScript libraries either they are hosted externally in some kind of a CDN or you can use, if it's your own app, you, you typically build a static resource um, and that's the way to make that available to your Visual Force uh, pages. All right, so let's move on to the, next, um, to the next architecture that I wanted to discuss with you. This one is going to be already a little more um, uh, sophisticated in the sense that it's an external app, it's a custom app, it's not an app that you load from your, um, from your Salesforce instance, it's an app that exists somewhere that you load from your own server, hopefully a Heroku server, and you load it, you load it this way, so this application is a JavaScript app, it's made of HTML and JavaScript, and then of course it's hosted externally, but you want to uh, integrate with Salesforce, so the way this is going to work, is first of all you're gonna have to authenticate and you're gonna do that using OAuth and then you're gonna have to you know get some data from Salesforce and conceptually this is what you're gonna do you're gonna use the REST APIs uh, you know to make calls to Salesforce and get the data that you're interested in so that's conceptually how it's gonna work however this is not gonna work because you're gonna run into the cross-domain policy uh, which is that by default a browser can only communicate back with the server from where the application was downloaded which in this case is my HTTP server here so trying to go to another server will give me a cross-domain policy error so uh, practically uh, the way this is going to work is uh, the same way it's going to start the same way you're gonna, you're going to uh, download you're going to start uh, you're going to load the application, you're still going to do your OAuth uh, authentication, but then when you need to access data, you're going to make the REST calls not to Salesforce directly, but back to your server, that's going to play the role of a proxy server, make the request on your behalf to Salesforce, and then send you uh, the data back. So, to illustrate that, um, that example, um, I have an application here that I put on my uh, blog um, a few weeks ago and that if you want and if you have a spare monitor somewhere you can try right now at bit.ly slash try um, and I'm going to go there myself uh, right away okay so this is uh, as I told you before it's an externally hosted application I hosted it on Heroku so what I'm going to do first is the first step of, of that workflow that I mentioned before, um, which is OAuth. And as you can see, I'm authenticating on a Salesforce domain, which is great because it's the trust that you don't know. Your third-party application doesn't know about uh, my credentials here. So I'm going to say, yes, please, you can do that. And I'm going to run my query, and you see that of course, this is just uh, raw data, but you see how it works. What's interesting about this example is that the whole thing is built in about 30, 40 lines of code, and uh, you can click the link uh, at the bottom here uh, to actually uh, take a look um, at the code, um, and we'll do that uh, actually just in a second, but I wanted to show you two additional examples, uh, again, of custom applications hosted externally. So the second one is, uh, again, that dashboard use case that we looked at before. Uh, but in this case, I 
basically host it externally as a custom app. So the first thing you'll need to do again is to authenticate using OAuth. And so at that point, it's going to go uh, get the data. Now, you see that in this case, if you look at the URL, I'm not inside a Visual Force page anymore. Maybe this is you know, the executive dashboard for my CEO. He wants a, an application that he can access you know, right away without too many clicks with a you know, very specific uh, user interface for him, uh, with maybe these, these menus here. So essentially, you know, 90% of the code is exactly the same code as the code that we used uh, in the Visual Force page, but we just deploy that application slightly differently. It still gets uh, the information from, um, from Salesforce. And since we are talking about completely custom applications, and you may still wonder, okay, what are some good examples of that? And, and so, as I said, these are completely, you know, custom different types of apps. So I started, this one is not, okay, here we go. Uh, I started exploring the, the, the idea of uh, presenting slides in HTML. And again, as you can see here, this is an entirely uh, custom uh, application. It host, it's hosted locally here uh, on, my, uh, on my own server. But these are essentially HTML slides. Okay, so here we go. Um, and I found it it could be interesting to explore that idea because then if I have slides that are connected to Salesforce, and that's the case because remember, I just authenticated with Salesforce, then in the middle of my slides, I could run queries. I could run SQL uh, queries, for instance. Not that that would make a lot of sense to do this uh, in a slide presentation, but the idea is that if you can do that behind the scenes, then you could do things like this now, uh, and that would make a lot more sense. So this is still the same use case, the executive dashboard, but now it's right there in the middle of your, you know, maybe sales presentation or board presentation, and that makes a lot more sense. So this is just kind of to open your eyes another example of a completely custom application hosted externally, but that is still uh, communicating um, and connecting with uh, Salesforce. So let's take just a minute now to uh, take a look at the code and see how you would actually build that. So remember from my kind of architecture slide, uh, the first thing you do is to actually um, authenticate with Salesforce using OAuth. And so this is the entire app. So you see that this version of the app is like 39 lines of code. And so when I click the login button, uh, I invoke that uh, function login, and basically what I'm doing here is this. I'm opening a JavaScript dialog um, to that login URL, which is, again, a Salesforce URL, which is great because, again, you're not you know, giving away your credentials to the third-party uh, website. And what's interesting here is that in that URL, I will have a call back from Salesforce, and that's basically here in redirect URI, I'm telling Salesforce where to call back. And Salesforce is going to call back if all goes well, if I validate, if I authenticate successfully, it's going to call back with a token. So this page is actually here, so I called it OAuth uh, callback. The only thing that this page is going to do is to parse the, uh, parse the query string of that URL and extract the authentication token and then pass that back uh, to my main page by calling that function OAuth callback. Now I can go back here, and here I will extract the access token. Once I have the access token, I can uh, instantiate a Salesforce client, and once I have a Salesforce client, I can start executing queries like whatever you typed in that text area, a SQL query, but in a traditional application, you know, whatever the query your application actually needs. So again, very simple steps. You authenticate with Salesforce, you get a call back with an access token. With that access token, you instantiate a Salesforce client, and with that Salesforce client, uh, you can actually start uh, running queries uh, against Salesforce. So that's um, what it takes. Also, if you look at the code, remember that you need a proxy. Now, that proxy 
can be written in any language. If you go to that GitHub repository that I was talking about, you have an example here of a Node.js implementation of the proxy. Uh, very simple, you see here it's 18 lines of code, so it's certainly not rocket science uh, to build uh, that kind of proxy, and you can build it with the language uh, of your choice. So we looked at um, we looked at this example. We looked at this one. If you are interested in running it on your machine, you can go bit.ly slash sf dash. Now this version hosted there is not connecting uh, to your org because you probably don't have the data that I need to uh, display the dashboard, so it's using a static um, static data, but if you want the app, you can get it from my GitHub repository as well. And then we looked at that completely different uh, you know, kind of slide presentation system that is also connected uh, to Salesforce. Now, uh, one thing that you need to know is that to actually uh, be able to instantiate that client, you need to create a connected app in Salesforce, and that's essentially going to give you the client ID that's required by the toolkit to actually, um, you know, create uh, that client. And the toolkit that I've been uh, using, I've been talking about, like, you know, to instantiate that client, uh, is actually part of the JavaScript REST API toolkit, which is an open source uh, project that you can find here at bit.ly slash uh, dk. All right, so that was number two. So let's move on to the third architecture. And this one, I'm going to be really brief on it because it's essentially a specialized case of the previous one. It's still an application that is hosted externally. Um, you know, maybe on Heroku server, but instead of running, you know, by itself full screen, you kind of embed it in an existing uh, Salesforce uh, user interface. And so what this really is, it's just like uh, an iframe uh, where that application is going to live, but it's, you know, more intelligent than, than a, a regular plain iframe because that iframe, uh, through some um, uh, posting to specific URLs will get context about not only the current user, but also the current page surrounding it. So if I need to make an API call within that application here, I know who the user is, and I know, for instance, if this is a product page, I know what the current product is, so I can make an API call knowing that and display relevant information in the context uh, of that Canvas application. So. Again, other than that, it's, it's very similar to the previous um, example that we talked about. Uh, to be able to interact with your environment in uh, the context of a canvas, there is also an SDK, and I put a short uh, URL here, bit.ly SF canvas uh, SDK. All right, so we are making uh, good progress. So I'm going to um, start talking now about um, the fourth architecture that I wanted to cover, and this one is going to be about hybrid apps. Uh, typically, applications that you would build with the mobile SDK and the uh, hybrid apps version of the mobile SDK. So I know you have heard that a million times, but I'll just take 20 seconds to quickly review with you what we mean by a hybrid app here. So. A uh, hybrid app is essentially a web app. It's built with, you know, the web stack, HTML, JavaScript, and CSS. But it's an app that you want to deploy through the app stores. And, of course, you can deploy index.html on the Apple App Store. So you will need a couple of additional features. You Uh, that you're going to use to wrap that application. It's essentially, from a technical point of view, it's called a, a UI web view. It's essentially an HTML container, a native HTML container. And that blue thing is going to be, you know, Objective-C if you target um, um, iOS. It's going to be Java if you target Android, etc. So it's a, it's a very thin uh, native a shell to wrap that application so that you can now deploy that thing because now it's packaged as a native app. You can deploy it on the different app stores. 
but that would still not look like a very interesting um, application. So the, the second component of a hybrid app, in addition to you know being wrapped, is that there is a bridge component to it. And by bridge, I mean that we are going to give you JavaScript APIs to access all the features of your device, like, for instance, the camera, the contacts, the GPS, the accelerometer, the compass, the file system, and things like that. All that you're going to be able to access using a consistent uh, JavaScript API. And the, you know, the, the mobile SDK is going to bridge that to the specific API calls of the underlying uh, mobile platform, iOS, Android, uh, etc. So that's in a nutshell what we mean by hybrid app. So now once you have that thing uh, running, again the question is, well, how do you integrate with Salesforce? And that's going to be actually super easy. Again, very similar to the externally hosted um, example that we covered, I think that was number two. So the first thing you'll have to do is to authenticate uh, because, of course, that application doesn't live, doesn't live in the context of your Salesforce instance. So at this point, we don't know who you are. You have to authenticate with OAuth. And once you have done that, um, you will be able to use the REST APIs to actually you know, get the data that you need from uh, Salesforce. Now, again, as I mentioned before, it's very similar to what we covered before. There is one big difference. When you run in the context of a hybrid app, that cross-domain policy restriction does not apply. So in this case, you can go straight uh, to Salesforce. You don't need a proxy uh, to actually get access uh, to Salesforce. All right, so to summarize what we covered here, so we spoke about the wrapper. We spoke about the bridge to give you access to the, uh, the device features. Now. There are really two ways to build a hybrid app. You can build a hybrid remote or a hybrid local. If it's a hybrid remote, what your app really is, it's an empty container that you then, uh, in which you, you then load visual force pages from the server as needed as the user navigates through the application. So essentially the thing that you deploy on the App Store is essentially an empty container and then you load uh, pages from the server as needed. So that's certainly one way uh, of doing it. And then the other way, it's you know the more traditional way in the mobile world, is to actually package um, your web app you know, as part of what you deploy to the App Store, so all these files actually run locally. All your HTML, JavaScript, and CSS files are actually installed as part of the app uh, locally. That's what we call hybrid local. Okay. Now, if you go for that approach uh, of a hybrid local, so everything is running locally, so that means that if you think about it, you can't leverage the server, you can't leverage Visual Force to actually build the UI. You're going to have to build all that yourself. Uh, so you need to think about you know, the right architecture to build uh, this type of application. And the trend today, when you really talk about uh, hybrid local, so these uh, applications that run locally at the client side, is uh, to use a single page application type of architecture, or sometimes called also single page architecture. And the way this works uh, is that you, you only have one HTML page in your entire app. No matter how big uh, your application may be, it's only uh, one page. But of course, there is a catch, and that is that app.js file, which can be a very, very big file, because really the way it's going to work, uh, you know, your entire application lives in a single HTML file, but in JavaScript, you will actually create the views um, of your application, inject them in the DOM as needed when the user navigates through your app. If you need a new view, you're going to create that in JavaScript, inject, in, inject it into the DOM, and then remove it from the DOM when the user navigates to, um, to another page. Uh, and that architecture is really well suited for mobile apps because since you don't go to the server, it's typically more responsive. Uh, you don't have the network latency to actually get uh, the next view back uh, from the server. And also, since you don't have that dependency on the server to get the UI, uh, it can work offline because you have all the views uh, locally uh, on your device. 
However, that sounds all great, but however, new challenges are being introduced by that uh, architecture. Uh, the, the first one is that you're probably not used. It's kind of a new thing to create large and complex applications entirely in JavaScript. And you're going to face problems that you never had to face before. Because if you think about it, um, that single page is going to live forever on your phone. The life expectancy of that single page can be actually days. It's still, it's always the same page. It's never refreshed. So now you need to think about things like memory leaks and things like that. You probably never had to worry about before because the life expectancy of an HTML page in the traditional model is so short that the likelihood you introduce a memory leak is pretty limited. And then another challenge is that, you know, people's expectation is pretty high now in terms of the quality of the user experience. So you have to have something that's kind of similar uh, in terms of the experience to a native application. So these are, these are really big challenges if you need to, if you want to do it right. And so I really recommend you, you take a look at JavaScript frameworks to kind of help you with these new challenges. Um, because a lot of very smart people have been working on these problem, uh, these problems for a very long time. So, as you can see, the the the, the landscape uh, of JavaScript frameworks is is pretty crowded. So I won't have time to cover, um, you know, to cover all these frameworks. But in a nutshell, I categorize them into these two columns. On the left, you have the full stack frameworks. They kind of cover all the problems you may face. Uh, when building such an application from DOM manipulation to, you know, that architecture layer, so essentially the, the providing some kind of an MVC architecture, to trying to make it, to make your application look good by providing a cool UI components. So things like jQuery, Moa, Sensha, they try to cover, you know, all that spectrum. And then the other approach is to kind of build your own stack. You say, hey, I'm going to use jQuery for DOM manipulation. Then I'm going to pick Backbone or Angular for MVC. And then to make my application look good, I'm going to pick, you know, maybe Twitter Bootstrap, Foundation, Ratchet, or Ionic. I mean, the choice is yours. Um, so this is really a good idea to kind of, you know, consider these frameworks. They do things uh, usually pretty well, and they are going to give you a really big jump start to build uh, these uh, applications. So what I wanted to do here, just as an example, this is not an endorsement of a specific stack, but just as an example, I wanted to, um, you know, um, explore one application built with Angular to provide the MVC architecture. Angular is going to provide you with templates, data binding, uh, routing, uh, and stuff like that. And then Ionic, so going back to the previous slide to really show you where it fits. So we're going to use Angular for MVC, and we're going to use Ionic for uh, the UI layer, Ionic is going to provide you with a bunch of really cool uh, components. Like, for instance, you know, sophisticated lists that have, you know, UI patterns like swipe to delete. You know, if you had to reinvent that yourself from scratch, that's not trivial to actually get that right. And it's kind of the user experience that people expect certainly on iOS. So all that comes out of the box when you use um, Ionic. Uh, Things like, you know, if you wanted to build a tabbed-based application with, with tabs at the bottom, like you see here, so all that comes out of the box, or sliding menu that you see uh, at the right here. So these are all components that come out of the box, uh, like action sheets uh, right here as well. So uh, I wanted to take just a moment here to explore uh, a simple example. So I'm going to go back. Uh, to my browser and uh, load that application. So the first thing that I'm going to do, because it's a hybrid app, it's a web app. So I'm able to actually run it in the browser. Of course, it's meant at the end of the day to run as a native app uh, on the device, but you can certainly do most of your development and debugging um, in the browser, which is exactly what I'm going to do uh, here. And so I'm going to make it look a little, mo a little more like uh, a phone. Okay, and here we go. Um, so these are some re these are some really plain defaults uh, that you get uh, in Ionic, and I kept that application really, really simple for a reason uh, because I want to make it uh, easy to understand. So let me just search here. 
and here we go. So very simple, but still you see that all the you know the cool native looking uh, sliding navigation, all that. This is all built in. This is not something that you have to try to you know mimic the native experience. This is entirely uh, built in. And then uh, if I go here. Uh, in Xcode, and of course you would never have to use Xcode except uh, potentially to package your application. So in other words, I'm never going to write a single line of Objective-C, but the idea is that, uh, and I'm going to run it in the, in the iOS simulator, this is basically your same, the exact same app uh, packaged now as a native app and running uh, in the iOS simulator. So. <clears throat> I wanted to take just a second to um, to look at the code for an application like that and show you uh, how you would build one. So this again is a single page application and you can tell because index.html is very, very concise. In fact, you mostly have a bunch of uh, strip tags to import, uh, you know, Ionic and uh, in this case jQuery and of course uh, the mobile SDK here and then some of your own code but you see that in terms of HTML I just essentially have the Ionic container which is essentially the navigator that's going to give you these nice transitions. Now to make it very clear you know we have a couple of minutes here uh, you know my expectation is not that you understand everything a line of code but I want to kind of demystify uh, the concept of building an application like that and uh, the different pieces uh, involved. So the core, the main file uh, of your application in this case would be an app.js where you define the module so the application here is, is called starter and it has some dependencies on Ionic, on Salesforce OAuth and then your controllers and your services. Now the, the main thing that you do here is to actually specify the routes of your application and that's really a kind of an important concept to understand and let me actually close this to show you exactly what I mean by that. Since it's a single page app, take a look at the URL here and you will notice that when I select one contact, you know, the what's after the hashtag is changing but the URL, the main URL doesn't change and what's after the hashtag is it's not going to generate a page refresh so that's how a single page application maintains states and dispatches uh, the application to different states and the way you do that is essentially by creating these states here so if the URL uh, for instance looks like this you see contacts with some kind of a contact ID then I'm telling Angular to load this controller with this template the template is really going to be the view okay so remember if I looked at the dependencies I had services, services is simply where you define your uh, data access so again the idea here is to really cleanly partition your code so services is really where you do your data access but in services there is no concept of user interface a service should know absolutely nothing about the UI so services are strictly about uh, getting access uh, to your data and guess what I'm going to use here my uh, Salesforce authentication service like I did before I'm getting that client and then I execute SQL statements that's really how I'm going to build my service layer for a Salesforce based uh, application and so once I know how to get my my uh, data using services then I can focus on my controllers and I'm going to focus only on one here this one so this is the controller for the details page you see that this one was the controller for the list page. So this application only has two, um, two pages. I'm going to use the contacts object with, which is that service that we just looked at. So that because the controller shouldn't know anything uh, about the way you get to your data and it's going to use the get method defined in the service to actually retrieve the specific contact and it's going to then put that contact into scope and that's going to be important because now when I built my template which if you look at it just looks like plain HTML with some placeholders you see these placeholders are basically saying hey when you find out who the contact really is insert it here okay so these are really the three components of an angular and ionic application service 
uh, services to get your data. Controller is kind of the glue between services and the view. You use the service to retrieve the data and then you put the appropriate uh, data in context, in the scope. And once you have your scope, you can build a view uh, using a template and using these placeholders. So that's essentially uh, what is involved to build uh, that type of application. All right, and we are getting to the end of this presentation with the uh, very last uh, architecture that we will cover. And this one is a little more intriguing, as you can see from this slide. There are a lot more components involved. And I really love this architecture because it tells the whole story of you know how Salesforce integrates with Heroku and how they can work together and why would you uh, you would use them together. So the application that we will look at in just a second is a consumer app. So it's essentially a loyalty program app, a loyalty app. So think about any store that wants to engage socially uh, with their customers. So you know if that brand is a huge brand think about your favorite airline for instance you know millions of customers so hopefully they have millions of customers uh, using that app and accessing their product catalog and that kind of thing so to do that they are going to go to a custom app that I built in this case with Node.js but you could build it you know with Java, Ruby, PHP whatever language you like um, and I'm going to get, you know, if I want to display products or special offers, I'm going to uh, get my information from there, from that Node.js application. But get, guess what? These tables in, that exist in Node um, or in Heroku in that Postgres database are actually tables with data coming straight from Salesforce. And the way these tables are kept in sync, in sync is by using a new component of the platform called Heroku Connect. And what Heroku Connect does, it simply, you know, what you do is you map objects in Salesforce. You say, you know, this consumer app should really work with product campaign contact and other objects. And then Heroku Connect is going to automatically create these tables in Postgres, in Postgres for you and keep the data in sync. So again, your consumer app, when it needs to display the product catalog or special offers, will get it from that Postgres table uh, in your Heroku app. But what, what I really like about that full picture is that, you know, to feed these campaigns, to feed these offers, that becomes at that point an employee-facing application, and you have some kind of marketing person a marketing manager that has to feed you know new offers into the system it's employee facing you can do that extremely fast configure that application using the Salesforce one app to go mobile or you know using your traditional uh, Salesforce interface to actually uh, feed your data so instead of uh, trying to describe that on a slide we are gonna uh, move back here and uh, I'm going to try to actually show that application running uh, on the simulator. Okay. So I'm going to run the app here. So again, you know, what's interesting about this is that this is again a hybrid application and this one is also, just so that you know, uh, it's also built with AngularJS uh, and uh, Ionic. So what I'm going to do here is um, actually go um, and open a Salesforce instance here so that you can see the relationship between these two things. So it's going to take one second here to log into uh, to this org, which should work. Let me see. What's Okay, so I'm not going to show uh, the uh, the Salesforce side. I'm still going to show you the application. Okay, let me uh, look at that here. Okay, so let's uh, take a look at the app. So again, this is a consumer app, um, and because it's consumer, you can log in. You know, you can create your own account with the company, or what most people like to do these days, uh, they are simply going to uh, log in using. Uh, some kind of social uh, system. So in this case, I'm using uh, Facebook. 
and so all right so at this point it pulled my it pulled my uh, Facebook profile including my picture and all that so what I wanted to show you uh, in Salesforce and I have a problem with my password there but essentially uh, it was as simple as showing you that that information makes its way uh, all the way to Salesforce through Heroku Connect you know you just logged in maybe for the first time and we will keep track of you in Salesforce we know who you are you we know you're coming from um, uh, we know you're coming from um, from Facebook and we know what you will do with the app so let me show you a couple of things in this app so I can uh, you know look at my profile I can change my preference and things like that so all that is automatically synchronized with Salesforce uh, through uh, Heroku and Heroku Connect and then you know here is what where it becomes uh, kind of interesting so these are all offers now this is this is actually coming from the uh, from the campaign object uh, in Salesforce uh, and I can okay so let's say this one uh, looks good and um, okay so at this point you can do a number of things so like for instance you can redeem the offer at this point we generate a QR code that you can present at checkout and the the discount will be applied to you automatically you can share it on Twitter you can share it on Google Plus you can share it on Facebook everything you do here and um, again that's something that you could see in um, in Salesforce there is a custom object that I call interaction there so everything you do like for instance you know you just shared it on Twitter this is gonna make its way uh, you know to Salesforce in that interaction object so we know what you liked we know what you redeemed and we can send you you know targeted offers uh, you know we know what you save to your wallet for instance and by the way uh, what they wanted to do here is give you points to engage socially with their product because it's kind of a win-win situation. So you see that I shared a bunch of stuff on social networks, so all of a sudden that you know got me points, and I just made it to the next level. Uh, and if you paid attention, you will see that the branding of the application just changed to actually reflect uh, my new level. And so you have you know similar things. So these these were like um, uh, offers you have similar things with uh, products where you can add to your wish list and I will keep uh, getting points for this so if I keep you know sharing uh, at some point very soon I should make it to the next uh, I'll do it one more time here and here we go so I made it to the next level so again all this information you can you can um, you know track in Salesforce but the point is these products are coming from the product object in Salesforce the the offers are coming from the campaign object in Salesforce and then I created additional custom objects like for instance you know we have a we have a store locator here where you can and this is another example of using uh, some kind of mapping uh, library um, and so I think that gives you an interesting example of a really branded uh, consumer app. All right, so um, with that, uh, so that was essentially the last uh, architecture that I wanted to uh, that I wanted to show you. So I wanted to quickly recap uh, what we covered today. So there are many ways you can leverage uh, JavaScript to your advantage when you build applications for Salesforce. Um, you can use uh, JavaScript in Visual Force pages. Remember, that was the Google Maps example and the D3 charts. Uh, you can create connected apps or so externally hosted apps. And in that case, you will have to authenticate through OAuth and then uh, get to your Salesforce data using uh, REST uh, services. You can also create mobile apps entirely in, uh, in JavaScript and HTML, and that's what we call a hybrid app. And again, the way to connect back, to integrate back with Salesforce is through OAuth and REST services. And in that case, you know, as I mentioned before, I kind of recommend you look at that single page architecture um, approach and, and look at frameworks like, for instance, Angular and Ionic, but there are, there are certainly other ones. And then finally, you can combine Salesforce, Heroku, and Heroku Connect to build uh, you know kind of engaging consumer apps and that's the last example that loyalty app uh, that we discussed together um, in terms of uh, resources um, if you want to learn more about this and get uh, going yourself uh, 
you know, obviously knowing more about the REST APIs, depending on the architecture that you choose, is going to help. So I put uh, the kind of the home page uh, on the developer website for the REST API there. If you want to build hybrid apps, uh, the, mo the mobile SDK is what you're looking for. Again, um, this is the URL to know more about it. If you're interested in looking at Angular and the Ionic framework, uh, I put uh, the information there too. Uh, in terms of next step, uh, I'm in the process of uh, finalizing, so this is really early access just for you guys. Um, I'm in the process of creating a workshop that is going to kind of take you through all the steps for creating applications uh, like this one. So if you're interested, I would be really interested in your feedback again. Uh, this is uh, this is just early access, but this is something you may uh, want to take a look at. And uh, finally, we need your feedback. We need to know what you want to um, uh, you know learn about next. We want to know what you thought about this seminar. If there are specific aspects of what was discussed today that you'd like uh, more information on, we could uh, certainly create a, a focused uh, webinar for that. So if you can take note of that uh, bit.ly URL and take a moment to actually uh, fill in that survey. That would be fantastic. A couple of quick things that I wanted to mention uh, before we go to Q&A. This, um, this summer, uh, we will have a program that we call Summer of Hacks. We will go to four cities, New York, Bangalore, Los Angeles, and London. So if you want to know more about that program, that's going to be a really fun uh, program, please go to that uh, URL and the hashtag for that is uh, Summer of Acts. So go there, you'll learn uh, a lot more about it. And of course, I wanted to remind you about Dreamforce in October and make you aware of that discount code uh, that you see at the bottom here. So if you want uh, to take advantage of that, uh, this is the discount code. 